Tonight is our second stage of knowledge through intuitions. And perhaps this is the most deepest subject we shall touch in the course of our self-discoveries. And that is the karmic responsibilities which each life must face. In all the ancient schools, the early incarnating principle was taught as the first stage of understanding. And right from the very beginning, the incarnating soul and spirit was instructed in the art of a karmic adventure. That was the ability to release the soul-mind essence into a physical body and step up its progress and evolution by making one life do the work of several. This ability to utilize life at a higher level of time consciousness is rather new to Western thought. But to the ancient wisdom, a life was so much endowed with potential of its own contribution that every moment of its living was considered of such importance that the karmic teaching was inscribed into its memory at the very early days. And for this reason, karmic knowledge, which is not always conscious knowledge, which has subconscious roots and strikes chords and assimilations right into the many live sequences to which we have accumulated a tremendous amount of reserve. For this reason then, if we are to really bring back the responsibility of individuals to society and to themselves and to world government, it isn't until the teaching of the karmic system of involvement in all events is fully understood shall we ever really get back to the idea of a universal consciousness in evolution. Perhaps the tragedy of all the religions when they lost sight of the importance of the incarnating methods in which life's continuity flowed not only backwards but forwards and sometimes could leap ahead far beyond its generations into many scenes of living beyond time consciousness. That a life should be able to go forward and backwards and move about in the rhythm of consciousness was so unnecessary to man's thinking that when he lost it, he immediately had to discover some messiah to take its place. It is this tragedy of trying to find someone else to pay the price of our own reaping and sowings. This seeking for some sort of messiah or paternal figure in some heavenly state or place who would, if we went on our knees at the last minute, give us some sort of forgiveness and let us out of the debt that we had incurred. This idea, too, of salvation through belief instead of knowledge was a great mistake when man left the path of responsibility and entered into the cheap salvation in which he sought that one Messiah would do the whole work of his own life and that his own life could be wiped out by a mere sort of verbal confession. Obviously, as this sort of took over, civilization deteriorated. Responsibility of government and of decisions of people, and landowners, and those with power and authority over their fellow men, decadency set in as soon as the karmic principle was suppressed. Here was something to free for all. Each could help themselves, it didn't matter and that the sense of responsibility decreased as the incarnating principle was lost. This may be a much better answer if we can bring this consciousness back than having to have prisons and laws and all forms of oppression and punishments to try and make people live a one life with a certain amount of discipline that if we can bring back the self-discipline of karmic awareness, 
then I think we shall see entering into the whole of the human relationships a complete new theme of understanding. The interesting thing about all these different developments of karmic mind is our discovery of recent times that the senses which were so despised, the five senses, the body which was looked on as something which would be depreciated, we begin to see that there is a new sanctity attached to the senses of body and that these senses are the means by which we incarnate between each life and either deepen its communication and build it into a new system of sensitivity, a new cultivation in which man is able to reach much further than the five sense system and extend himself into far greater dimensional knowledge. Now dimensional knowledge is the thing we need as well as the karmic knowledge of self-responsibility that no man escapes his own judgment that what he does to others will be multiplied ten times upon himself and that which he does not do will have to be accumulated in time and the burden will be twice as heavy each time he neglects his responsibility to his fellow men. This is not reward by punishment. This is, a re this is more or less a system of knowledge training where a new concept of relationship in the humanities between ourselves and others can be established in a universal sense. But to revert to these senses, this sense of hearing and feeling and touching, sense of knowing, sense of thought, here we find our very fine channels. And these channels are able to reach into certain zones and into these various zones or planes there exists a tremendous amount of skill and wisdom and uh, the blueprint or the pattern of many lives can be discerned. You may think that the sense of smell and the sense of touch is a physical thing but we're beginning to realize now that this is a cosmic thing, that these senses are really the channels of communication between the lower conscious life and the higher one. Perhaps one day we should be able to use these senses as more direct forms of communication than we do now. At the moment they are very vague and in the last sensitivity of civilization we've cut ourselves off from a lot of self-training. Now try and realize that the amount of incarnating principle involved in one life is so small that there's hardly a third of our consciousness that is incarnating now. The other two thirds are on the other planes. They cannot encompass the ego personality into a one vehicle life. This is important because it means that there are two other parts of ourselves which are waiting to be used. And these other two thirds, which although they're not incarnating with us, are still a part of the overall consciousness. Thus, many lives can be used at the same time. One may have been a merchant, one may have been an artisan, an artist, one may have been a good craftsman, one may have had the gift of words and of speech, or of the sense of touch and sense of smell. One could have had the sense of feelings, and each one of these is like a spiral staircase that goes up from one dimension to another. So the smell of a rose in an old English garden could quite easily be the same smell in an etheric garden on a higher plane. And the sense of touch, the feeling of a child's hand within your own, the sense of warmth, of healing and the comfort of one another is not just an earthly thing at all. This is a celestial thing, the touch of heaven, the kiss of life. It is the great love of the, uh, the, great love of the soul reaching out into the, the caress, into that deep compassion of communication. And it, so it is with the breath of life. The breath is not merely the breath of the body. It is the great prana 
of the whole of the invisible world. One day we shall live entirely off our pranic foods. Uh, at the moment we only absorb a very small amount of it. But I'm sure if we all went in for deep breathing, we'd need far less food and we'd live far more on the air than we do at the moment. Uh, our present standard seems to be the coffee pot or the teapot uh, rather than the prana energies which can be drawn in the body and uh, through the systems and by the heart and blood streams can recharge the vitalities of the inner resources. Yoga, of course, realized this many times. It knows that by the disciplining of the senses that is raising their purity and sensitivity, they raise the consciousness of the soul. That is, they raise the areas of communication. So now let us look a little more kindly on these five senses of ours and realize that they are spiral staircases in which the senses of aroma and speech and sound and touch can ascend into the very heavens of matter and can descend again into the very heart of man. Thus purity and the cultivation of the senses. This becomes a new art where before many would side try to sit in a sort of a, a darkness of meditation to increase the soul potential. We find that by sensitizing the senses we can raise conscious awareness. But this also brings problems. Because as we sensitize the senses into a higher awareness, we also find that there's a lot of bad smells about and there's some very uncomfortable feelings around and the certain interdimensional forces are but rough and there are many inconveniences once we sensitize these areas. But the point is you begin to live. Touch and smell and taste and sound and sight in the vision all become the most beautiful forms of expression. Where before they were muted and hardly registered the touch of a petal, they hardly noticed the difference between a change of air or of an environment or of an atmosphere. Where before they went by absolutely unnoticed, now they begin to reach out into life and life reaches out to us. What a different use then we can use in the karmic sense by using the senses as steps to a higher awareness of information, a higher awareness of inner knowledge and the deepening of the concept of wisdom. For instance, feeling perhaps is one of the greatest senses of wisdom we can ever have. And to, to feel our way into problems and to feel our way into time and to feel our way in and out of time and to use this sense recording as a sort of sensitive antenna which is almost like an invisible uh, spiritual radar which goes well ahead of us and then we are indeed using the radar antenna of the consciousness of the invisible eye and reaching out into a new climate of feeling, into a new climate of relationships. This again has its problems, because where before you found people weren't so bad, now if you get too near them and too long, you find a little is quite enough. And this increasing of the senses, the staircase of the senses, into this new conscious living, is going to make a certain amount of separation. It was where before we didn't mind big crowds, now we find we don't like big crowds. Where before we could sit down and devour a big chunk of animal, we can't quite do it the same now. Where before we had some sort of music which we thought was this to that, now we find our sense of rhythm is changing and the inner ear is beginning to pick out sounds it didn't know before. And it's the same with vision, you begin to notice color and you notice people's sense, that is the sense of a person, the auric atmosphere. You don't see this in so many colors, but you see it as shadows or as lights. And these shadows and lights are very important because these are the first hint of the many mantles of our lives. Because we wear our many lives like invisible clothing 
And this is what the Holy Ones use as a sort of uh, estimation of who you are, where you are, and what you are doing. This ability to shine through the darkness and shroud of an earth body and to simulate and stimulate the whole environment round you through auric harmonizing and through the strengthening of the magnetic currents which run through the aura. This is an essential part of every therapist because without this sort of sensitivity we can neither diagnose, neither advise, nor help. Neither can we transmit the vital energies which must go via the senses through the physical bodies from the higher bodies themselves. So the sensitization, that is the knowledge of the greater awareness of incarnating principles, we begin to see then that it not only is life flowing one into the other, but we're tapping the resources of many other conditions beside our own. But this also brings in a new phase of thinking, because we must realize that each earth incarnation is self-selected. And although you may not like to think that you selected what you are and the conditions you've got and the family that's around you or the mother-in-laws or the other things which we acquire in the course of earthly births, make no mistake about it, all these things were carefully thought out. Not that we have any particular affinity to a family because your affinity is to a higher consciousness. It isn't just a biological thing. But here again becomes responsibilities. Perhaps the most frustrating life that anyone can live is the development of the talents, that is, the virtues. And these waiting incarnations, I always have a special sympathy for them, because this means that patience and courage, consistency and uh, emotional control uh, to avoid judgment and to develop compassion and forgiveness all these things sound just words, but sometimes a whole life may be, as some people would call, wasted on these things. And people often say, I'm, I'm not doing anything, I'm frustrated, I'm not spiritually getting anywhere, and so on. And one knows that they are in what we call a waiting incarnation. It is an incarnation which is definitely set out to achieve these qualities, these disciplines, because its assignments in the other planetary systems uh, will be so demanding that unless these forces have been disciplined and shaped and molded and forged in the waiting incarnating state then we should be totally illiquid to even take on the fresh level of incarnating service. So think of this when you think you're wasting your time, when you think nothing is happening, when you're not getting anywhere and uh, that life doesn't seem to have the meaning for you as it does for others. Because it isn't the outward life where the work is done, it is on the inward life. I've known many of you here for a good many years now, and I can see the changes in you which you perhaps can't see in yourself. I can see in your faces and the way you walk and talk, and the way and the things you do and the way you think, have completely altered over the years. And you're not the person that you first put your foot to the pathway to seek this consistency of knowledge and unfoldment. This is nothing to do with me. This is merely that your sensitivity has increased within your own self and that individually you are each reaching out into the pool of your own karmic experiences and are using your other lives and the other higher levels of personality and bringing them into this particular earth life that you're living now. This is self-work, it is often self-disappointing, but at the same time we must see that an incarnating process is so valuable that every expression must be used and every minute is of use. Now the other interesting part about the karmic knowledge is that we often and do incarnate in between this life on many other planets as well. This is an interesting point, that this ability to travel to other stars, to other systems, 
and utilize other body systems while we are still in tune with our earth, uh, our earth debts, our earth links, and with our earth business. This ability of a soul to incarnate on other planes, in between an earth consciousness, is not only valuable to us, but it shows how useful it is that a life should incarnate wisely, and it should go out wisely, and make use of its resources while it's here. We only think of our nine systems, nine star system, which is so-called solar. But you must remember that we are only looking at a third dimensional part of this system. Fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh dimensions would intensify these numbers by thousands. And so what we look on as empty space, with just a few lights in between, is really packed solid with interdimensional star formations which carry conscious lives and higher civilizations and greater states of consciousness than we are here. Naturally we do quite a lot of our incarnating work during sleep and rest and a lot of this is also done into what we call the subconscious levels. We're beginning to realize now that the subconscious memories are something more than just childhood experiences. Uh, these are deep reservoirs which perhaps one day we shall learn by meditation and development to make far more use of. To understand this more we must realize that incarnation is only for the soul, mind and spirit. The vehicle that we use for that incarnating is the least of it all. It is not important, it has no value other than a vehicle. So the mind and the soul and the spirit, and especially the mind in this case, it is important that it becomes sensitive to other attunements and can deepen its rate of conscious awareness into fresh levels of understanding. Now let us go further into this when we talk of pre-selectivity of an earth. At one time we thought that souls came back within a matter of a hundred years or so, but now we're beginning to find that with these interplanetary incarnatings that there may be as many as 500 to a thousand years between an earth incarnation. This sounds a lot at first, but when you think that we are millions and millions and millions of years old and yet we're still the youngest star in space, we still got a long way to go before we get saturation point. Remember these things when we're thinking of a personal life. It is not personal at all, it is cosmic. And every event that we take place is a cosmic event because it is linked to some other standard of, of events which are going on into the great space beyond time as well as in time. And every soul must be linked all its time within this consciousness. Once it loses its root, within this conscious direction, then it is indeed a lost soul. And there are many unfortunate lost souls who have lost the thread of their consciousness, who have lost the roots of their karmic records, who have sort of strayed so far from the pathway of the inner knowledge that their senses become deprived of discipline. This explains gambling and alcohol, explains how it is that it's so easy for suicides and many other things to happen, is where the lost soul tries to get back into the place that it thinks it knows. It tries to shortcut its wilderness and try again to enter into some sort of known state. It is an escape from lostness, from nothingness. This nothingness is rather rampant at the moment and many parts of the religions which fail and many political systems which rise and fall the state of the lost soul is increasing and this is where we can help so many with the younger generations by karmic teaching begin to open up again to them the great map of the universe put in perspective the soul adventure of sphere after sphere and each life as a generating force 
by which the forging of character and nature and the unfolding of the invisible resources and to see the whole evolution out into space as much as it is in the intimate part of a garden and to see the great principle of life that touches every race and religion and seeks to free it into a new vortex of truth. Once we begin to release the karmic knowledge into soul life living, the soul ceases to be lost. And no one no longer wants to escape through degrading the senses. Degrading the senses either by excessive alcohol or depriving the body of a karmic energy through smoking. And either to de de debase the body into uh, extremes in which they waste and lose their vital force. These are the senses which will rise us into the very heavens of new experiences. But when they become lost and lose leadership, they take us down into the very depths of hell. This is a division of consciousness, where the root is lost, where the sense of directions become so dim that man only thinks that by butchering his brother he can solve his problems. And by more laws and oppression, taxation, and bigger guns and larger bombs can he feel secure. We can see society trembling at its very roots at this very moment. It's lost in its own negativeness. It has no vision beyond its own small earthly carcass. It can't see the great evolutionary principle that's calling to the very soul of him to release him into a new freedom of living. As we look at the world trying to solve its problem by mass armaments, by one religion fighting another, and one race being stirred against another, as we see these great conflicts of the lost all merging together into one vortex in which one day perhaps we shall all be involved. The teaching of the ancient wisdom and the unfolding of the karmic teachings and the widening of the whole consciousness of life, death and birth into a new concept of thinking is perhaps the only cure for this selfish one life materialism which engulfs the whole of human affairs. When one man knows that he's looking at another man and what he does to him now, he will face back onto his own body ten times more. And when he realizes that death is, a th is an instant thing, in that he, dis he disposes the law of balance, he places himself outside the law of supply, and he isolates himself from the blueprint of his birth, and that he puts himself into great states of danger and loses the protection of the spirit, then he's going to hesitate very quickly before he incurs this type of return against the actions of a short-term uh, advantage. So many things are involved in karmic teachings that I think if we can get them back without going back to reincarnation, that seems to frighten people. And perhaps there's very good reason why it should. Because it sort of smacks of coming back from tombs and gravestones and resurrecting of bodies and trumpets blowing on some day of judgment. It has a sort of a horrible condemnation to it. It's afraid. It frightens people. They want to escape this one without even thinking of coming back for another heavy dose of this sort of discipline of the senses. So let's take that word right out of, of esoteric thinking and put back incarnation, the continuity of flow of consciousness throughout the sense. The great evolutionary principle, working as the teacher, the healer, the leader, and the inspirer. And to see life not as an enemy or a conflict of gain, but to see it as an investment in living and a new concept in understanding. If we can raise this idea that affinities and non-affinities can work together, and that the laws of the universe apply to every type of person. Whatever race, color, creed we may be temporarily occupying at this time, or whatever sex we may be using at this time, 
we should be using them all at different other times. So don't let's be a little bit too quick on the draw and look down because perhaps we already passed through that stage or it's waiting for us at the next one. So don't let's be too quick to condemn or to judge or to rule or to avoid or to seek new issues of understanding. There's an interesting thing about soul incarnating and that is to start at the lowest point rather than the highest point. When you look at your Akashic record before you come and we can study these for a long time and see the blueprint of our lives unfold before us. But it isn't the blueprint of must, it's the blueprint of mud. It might be, it may be, it's going to be entirely up to your own free will whether you go to the top of this spiral or whether you go to the bottom. It's going to be up to your own sense of responsibility whether you undertake to your duties and your loyalties that you have already stated to the higher ones and the holy ones and that the path which has been assigned to you will not run away nor neglect it nor pick them up and put them down or think that God owes us a living or that there's some special thing that we are which other people are not. If we can get rid of all this personality of self, and as we look at this record and say we can either ascend into the very heavens of consciousness, or we can deliberately and selfishly lose our way and have a short burst of some sort of sense life, and then have remorse and regret for many lives to come. The potentiality of karma is opportunity. And if we can use opportunity to store up a karmic, not a debt, but a balance. I would like to feel that each one of you, as you go back, go back with a lot of bills paid and go back with a lot of credit to your holy name. This perhaps is the, one of the nicest ways of seeing going back home. When I was young, we always made a compact that we'd never go home when we were broke. We'd only visit home when our pockets were lined and when the good news was good. When it was bad, then we kept away. And this sort of thing was rather necessary because things were a bit hard and there were troubles enough at home without us adding to them. And I was thinking of them the other day, that this idea of only going home with good news and just minding your own business and working hard when it's bad. Not to invest our troubles and miseries on other people, but only try to share the high points, the good points, the points which are worth sharing. I think as each one of us step out of these carcasses of ours, these encumbrances and hindrances, for that's what our bodies become, because the more you sensitize the senses, the more you realize the hindrances and the limitations for the higher consciousness comes pouring through at every level and the more you know about this sort of thing the more difficult it is to deal with it. I was very interested in a spiritual unfoldment the other day when they didn't talk of death they gave it another word which rather fascinated me they called it evaporation that to evaporate yourself out of your earthly bodies and the essence condensed and went straight up into the higher spheres and leave all the rubbish behind I thought it was a lovely thing and it seemed to be a nice way to go perhaps that was the way the Christ went but this type of being able to essence the body into such a high concept that we could literally evaporate out of it and take the essence of one life into the other life and make it sort of flow into a continuity of consciousness. This is a beautiful way of seeing tomorrow. Much better than seeing it as birth and death. I just saw it as I came up the stairs, register of births and deaths, and I thought, well, who else registers these besides just the Westminster Council? Uh, this is something we're all doing ourselves because we're coming and going in history with the same people coming backwards and forwards. We are these very people 
we are the same brothers, the same sisters, the same races, the same religions, all nicely and beautifully mixed up together, and in the mixing we can get some very nice contrasts and some very useful building material. Now to finalize on this point, this is a very difficult for you to teach this sort of teaching to people who haven't any other concept than just one life living. In fact, it's almost heresy to mention to other people that it takes more than one experience on an earth to make a saint. A lot of people seem to think that they come here for a, a few years and they go back with wings are singing, sit on clouds forevermore, and, and after that everything's hunky-dory. It's very difficult for people who have tied themselves to one life concept to gradually open up their minds to universal evolution to the in and outflow of universal consciousness which is intermingling with the various levels of mind and spirit. But if you're careful and you keep off reincarnation and talk of incarnation, you may find yourself much more receptive and don't push it too hard because most people have a deep fear of incarnation. Possibly it may be that they haven't paid their debts and they don't want to go back too soon to face the person who they owe it to or the conditions they owe it to. But I think if we face up to responsibilities as we are, we needn't fear our debtors, uh, neither need we worry about those we own. These are all a part of the tools of living. And so long as we've got a good share of both of these things, then I'm sure the concept of karmic teaching can come back into all world's religions or no religions, but come back as a philosophy of discipline, which man can look at his own actions and his own deeds in the light of evolution, and there see the seeds of matter of the sowing and reaping right on the very conscious doorstep that he cannot die, these things cannot be escaped, they are utter realities which we must accept as we accept birth and life itself. So now let us go to meditation. <coughs> okay. Our feet firmly to the ground, back pressed into the chair, close one's eyes and put the head at the best poise that we can find it. Now let the body just sort of go loose and free and enter into receptivity. <coughs> Communication is the breath of life. As we move in our being from one center to another, so do we record each event on the sensitivity of our perception. As each of our senses are spiral staircases, into new sensitized worlds. We can feel and reach into new dimensions of experiences and widen and deepen the whole area of our response. Let us see the purifying and the cleansing as stepping stones into a new world of living. Here is the aroma and the fragrance of life. The sensitivity, the feeling, the silence. And in the sound and in the movement, in the rhythms, we can pass the very essence of heaven into the consciousness of our feelings. Let us wear a mantle of our many lives, radiantly and joyfully and unashamedly. 
for nothing can be hid. There are no secrets. All is conscious in light. All things are known. So let us enjoy the truth of these things. Let us watch the incarnating process of each day and each year as it deepens and ennobles, rarefies and cleans the dross of other livings and strengthens with courage and insight and perception the visions of tomorrow. But we may be led on into other worlds, into new concepts of understanding. May heaven and earth flow in and out of us, and the music of the spheres and the stars be in our voice and in our melodies. To know that we are our brother's keepers at all levels and at all times. And that as one life flows into another, <coughs> so do we build a vehicle for another living, richer, stronger, better than the one we wore before. Let us see the incarnating principle for mind, soul, and spirit, and not to let it become all body minded, for this is but a vehicle efficiently composed for our using. And then, in the quietness of our new thinking, Go forth not as a messiah, but as a teacher. And seek quietly to impart our deeper knowledge, our richer understanding. And so help to sway and fill world thought, world mind, world thinking, into a new concept of understanding of ourselves towards one another. And so rewrite the pages of history through each life's mantle of giving and sharing and the awakening of the universal consciousness in us and in all things around us as a life well served and a life well lived to the principle of all eternal things.